and we'll have the call to order and roll call. Thank you, Trustee Eisen. Trustee Abrego. Here. Governor Brown, Trustee Carney. Here. Trustee Day. Trustee Eisen. Here. Trustee Fagan. Here. Trustee Farrar. Here. Trustee Furstenberg. Here. Trustee Hinton. Here. Trustee Kimbell. Here. Trustee Melendez de Santana. Trustee Morales. Here. Lieutenant Governor Newsom, Trustee Nylon. Here. Trustee Norton. Here. Speaker Rundin, Trustee Reyes Salinas. Here. Trustee Simon. Here. Trustee Stepanek. Here. Trustee Taylor. Here. Superintendent Torlakson, Chancellor White. Present. We have a quorum, Chair Eisen. Um, thank you. This is the time in which the board will hear from public speakers. Uh, as always, in fairness to all speakers who wish to speak and to allow the board to hear as many uh, speakers as possible, while at the same time having sufficient time to conduct our business, uh, the totality of time allotted for public comment is 30 minutes. Uh, therefore, each speaker will have one minute for their remarks. Um, a buzzer will indicate when the time ends, and I please, I ask the speakers please to yield the microphone when you hear the buzzer so that the next speaker may address the board. Uh, will you call the speakers, please? William Blischke. Charmaine Lawson. Is William Blischke not here? I'm here. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> I'm here. Good morning. I'm president of CSU IRFA, which not surprisingly is the largest organization of its kind in the country, since this is the largest um, public university in the country. We have three very important publications I want to point out. This one, which you can get copies of by calling our Northridge office, is what we give to all retiree faculty. We also have a newsletter quarterly called the CSU Reporter. You can get that online at our website, csuorfa.org. We also have a very unique thing called the Survivor's Guide. And the other title is Make Sure Your Wishes and Records Are Documented. When you pass away or anybody in your family does, it's a very complex thing. This is the only comprehensive guide I know of. We give it to members who join. You can get it by calling our office for $10 a piece. It's very unique and very valuable. Um, I've told you before that we have 18 types of volunteering that we encourage all of our members to engage in at the campus. A 19th one, that I've just encouraged them to take advantage of is what we call dreamer volunteer advising. We're encouraging our members to get go through the ally training process at the campuses and then provide advice to the dreamers, whether they're students, employees, or whatever. Uh, um, our state council is going to be meeting. We meet twice a, twice a year. We're going to be meeting at Cal State Long Beach on October 21st. And I am going to encourage them to support the ASCSU positions on general education and remediation. Those are things that should be very carefully done over time with full consultation. The Million Shoe Campaign I've talked about before. After last time the meeting, two presidents came up with to me, the presidents of my home campus, Dominguez Hills, and the president of Long Beach, and they're implementing the program again. After my presentation to ASCSU, Sac State and Sonoma are joining the CSU Million Shoe Campaign. I encourage the rest of you to do so as well. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that we engage in lobbying and we want to be much more involved in any task forces that you create or the Chancellor's Office creates or ASCSU creates. We're trying to work more closely together with all the constituent groups, including CSSA, and I'm going to be meeting with them at Dominguez Hills at their January meeting. So I'm willing to answer any questions afterwards since I think I've taken more than my minute, but thank you very much.
<laughs> Good morning. I would like to thank the body for this opportunity. Diversity inclusion is the language frank of our time. In the realm of higher education is the quantified as data, shared as reports, but true and told diversity and inclusion goes beyond numbers crunched and data contrived. It, in its most literal sense, is perceived perception of the qualities of decency and trust, a trust placed upon the students and the parents, upon the system. That trust was broken a triple, excuse me, April 15th, 2017, and decency was shortly in tow. David Josiah Lawson, a young man who courageously, relentlessly sought to bear the lives of those around him, was taken. This is the third murder of a black student in the large community of Humboldt State University. And yet, in 2015, when demoralized students tried to meet with the current administration, those pleas gone unheard. In 2016, when students like Josiah spoke up against the climate of racial animus and hatred at HSU in the larger community, those cr cries went unheard as well. Now we fight for him. Niceties simply will not do. The time to act is now. I ask you to imbibe the same forethought, passion, and integrity as Josiah in this pursuit for justice. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michelle Charmaine Lawson. Josiah Lawson is my son. I'm sorry, guys. My son was viciously taken on April 15th in Arcata at an off-campus party. My son was smart. He was energetic, full of laughter, and he just wanted to pursue his goal. My son was a would have been a third year student at HSU studying criminologists. I have two other children. I have a son who's currently at the University of Arizona and a daughter who's 13 and she's currently home. And the loss of my son and their brother has been devastated to my family, myself, the community of Arcata. I've asked for a special meeting to put my son on their city agenda so that we can discuss student safety and also discuss the investigation. It's been five months and still no one is in custody um, for the brutal murder that took place on April 15th that took my son's life. I'm asking the committee to reach out to APD the district attorney's office. I've spoken to Dr. Lisa, I'm gonna mess up your last name, president of um, president at HSU to be more um, involved. There is a fourth meeting of each month that the city of Arcata has designated to my son to discuss the investigation and also to discuss um, student safety. And I've asked her to be there so that student of color and all student at HSU can feel safe. No parent should receive that phone call that I received that dreadful morning and having to drive to Arcata to bring my son back home and to lay my son to rest. I don't want this to happen to any other student. So I'm asking you guys, please do everything that you can for my son. He went to this university to, to further his education and that's all he wanted. And I need you guys to be more more involved. Please don't let what happened to my son go unsolved. It's five months and still no one is in custody. I'm desperately seeking your help. Thank you. Naomi Waters, Sky Dent, 
Patrick Choi. I'm oh, Sky. Uh, I don't know. Is Naomi here? Oh. Um, education served me well over the years. I um, was a Star Trek writer. I created a safe sex video for the CDC that no teenager ever looked at. And I was a University of North Carolina professor. So I was hoping to give all that back by being in the teacher credentialing program at Cal State Bakersfield. At the last meeting, I presented evidence that Cal State Bakersfield Professor Mahmoud Suleiman in the teacher credentialing program over a three-year period had defrauded students by making them sell a fake book, which looks like this. So I wanted to, um, I mean, I know we don't usually come here to celebrate things, but I wanted to applaud the trustees because I fought for five to six months with um, the president of CSUB and other people to get it taken off the shelves. And within weeks of coming here, it was taken off the shelves. It's piled in the storeroom bookstore and it's no longer, you can find it on the website. However, I have screenshots if anybody wants to, uh, wants to see that. So I just wanted to applaud the trustees for taking care of the students. Thank you. Uh, good morning, I'm Patrick Choi. I'm president of Academic Professionals of California, APC. We're a unit for uh, employees, academic support. Regrettably, APC is also worlds apart from reaching an agreement during this full contract bargaining. Uh, I am going to provide a different illustration on some of the difficulties that uh, we've been uh, facing um, at the table. Uh, you know, the Board of Trustees always talks about equity, access, and opportunity. Well, uh, several contracts ago, we did make changes to the fee waiver program, essentially the doctoral programs. At the time, it was presented that these programs are self-support. Uh, the CSU cannot support, uh, you know, the funds and everything, the supplementation for these programs, and that everybody would need to be the same. Everybody would need to be the same. APC discovered in 2016 a new eligibility program provided by the Chancellor's Office that included certain employees, MPP and confidential employees, were fully eligible for the fee waiver. Uh, APC represented employees were interested at that time and they still are today. So uh, that's something that we are encountering. Uh, there's just something not quite right about that picture. Thank you. Dago Argueta, Kevin Weir, Molly Talcott. Good morning, Dagoberto Argueta, Vice President of APC. I, I, ca I come here with a very simple, straightforward message from our members, the academic professionals of California who are your advisors and counselors. And that is that the current proposal on the table from the CSU is simply not ratifiable at this point. We have been visiting the 23 campuses and unequivocally our members have told us to, uh, to bring you this message we are not going to ratify the proposals currently on the table from the CSU. We made no unreasonable demands from the university during the crash years, but we expected during the relatively good economic times, we receive decent proposals at the table, which we have not at this point. And please listen to uh, these people. Yesterday, when I was here um, at the, at the uh, proceedings yesterday, we heard a young student athlete say that one of the things that kept him going, uh, trying for his uh, degree, was the advising and the counseling that he received at the CSU. That is us, Unit 4 people. And the question is, if our uh, students appreciate the work that we do, why can't you? Thank you. Good morning, my name's Molly Talcott. I'm a proud member of CFA and of the faculty at Cal State LA. 
As educators, we have a moral obligation to support all of our students, including both DACA eligible and ineligible undocumented students. CFA has been in constant communication with faculty, students, and staff colleagues in our efforts to organize in solidarity with the CSU's many undocu scholars. Chancellor White, you've issued a memo supporting DACA students, and in the spirit of that declaration of support, we have suggestions for what else the CSU can do, and there's much more to be done. For example, first, there's a great need to create Dreamers Resource Centers on all CSU campuses, staffed by those trained to provide necessary information, support for students' mental health, and academic needs. They should include spaces for students to meet, study, and organize, as well as access legal advice. So we urge you to rush implementation of AB 21, our CFA-sponsored bill that was uh, carried by Ash Kalra and that we expect the governor to sign. Second, we need to study the effectiveness of our dream centers. Currently, there's no research on how undocumented students are performing in this crisis. Are they remaining in school and graduating on time? What happens afterward? And what specific needs do they have that can be supported, not just at the campus level, but also at the system level? Third, faculty should be included as coordinators and advisors at dream centers. They should be places of research where students can also become scholars. I had an excellent student at Cal State LA who was doing original research on uh, the health needs of undocumented youth, um, but she was doing it at the UCLA Labor Center on a paid stipend. We should have uh, scholarship going on in our dream centers. Can we have you wrap CSU. it up, please? Sure, and Kevin Weir won't speak, so. That's why I'm going over. Um, so faculty uh, should be appointed as directors in partnership with staff colleagues. And fourth, uh, we need a system-wide committee to study and create a report similar to the Ethnic Studies Task Force. Um, faculty, staff, and administrators can work together on this and continue to make recommendations for ongoing efforts. Um, and uh, thank you. I'll stop. And Kevin Weir won't be speaking. Ayaslin Ramirez, Marvin Morales, Asia Gonzalez, and Pat Gant. Um, good morning. Sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. But uh, my name is Marvin Morales, and I'm a student from Cal Poly Pomona, and I'm also a proud member of Students for Quality Education. As the definition of free speech seems to be skewed more and more every single day, it is imperative for the CSU system to create and strictly implement policies that define what is free speech and what isn't, and that includes uh, hate speech. The increase in racist and hateful slurs all over our campuses, ranging from death threats in our bathrooms to personal and deliberate targeting of some of our fellow students, is completely unacceptable and disheartening. To allow such things to happen without any real repercussions is an embarrassment to the system because we should be champions of safe and inclusive spaces where all students should feel safe and welcome. As you may know, Cal State Fullerton is going to be hosting an event with one of the most offensive, polarizing, and downright scariest political figures, the white supremacist Milo Yiannopoulos. And they are not the only ones. Milo is also in negotiations to appear at Bakersfield as well. The fact that this is even happening on our campuses still boggles my mind. A person who degrades women endlessly, promotes violence against people of color, and disregards rape culture as just a fantasy should have no spaces or platforms in our schools. You're all, you are all so afraid of Charlottesville happening on one of our campuses and want to do everything to prevent that from happening, and there's one easy way to prevent it, and that's by not having him perform at any of our campuses. We all know that you are all going to hide behind this whole freedom of speech clause, but it's ironic how administrators and student governments are quick to cancel any type of, uh, any type of peaceful and nonviolent forms of speech, yet for conservative and extremist forms of speech, they get the green light with no hassle. Why is it that for every action that is considered liberal and progressive, these extremists can harass us and counter protest us while progressive students get shut down if they try to encounter it and the hate by, um, Excuse me. Can they try to counter the hate up, by exercising their own rights to assemble and free speech. Administration cannot allow one side to exercise their free speech rights while discouraging it from the other sides. Besides the issue with free speech, there's events. These events take away financial resources from students. While when Milo showed up at San Luis Obispo, we paid over fifty thousand dollars in security. We expect to pay at least double for his appearance at Cal State Fullerton. Not only to mention the militarization of our campuses with snipers and SWAT teams heightening tensions and the like of violence. So as my closing remark, you all need to reevaluate your, opin your opinions on, 
how you all need to reevaluate how opinions are regulated on our campus because it's obvious you show how uh, it obviously shows how much you want to control what gets said and what doesn't just like all those dystopian books we've read in our classes quick picking sides and promote safety peace tolerance and inclusivity on our campus instead of hate misogyny and overall racism Good morning, my name is Yosele, I'm part of SQE and I'm um, from Dominguez Hills. I want to start off by saying that education is a right, not a privilege. We cannot afford another tuition increase. You might not be ready to announce it yet, but we know it will come just like we knew last year. Now is the time to work together to find alternative ways to make up for the lack of money that is not coming from the state, not to charge the students because the more we pay, the longer we stay. For now, we ask for the needs of non-traditional students to be met. We need longer hours for student services like financial aid, the library, admission, missions and so forth. We need more evening and weekend classes, especially for the math department at Dominguez Hills, President Hagen. We pay the same amount and should get the same in return. Lastly, we stand against Executive Orders 1100 and 1110. Allowing students to double our GEs with their major classes diminishes the quality of our education and consequently the amount of classes offered. Don't cut our remedial classes. It will negatively affect students and faculty. To propose these changes shows how the CSU system is feeling students of color, marginalized groups, and non-traditional students. The CSU was designed to serve these specific students, not to fail them. To do so would be to take a step backwards in our political and educational history. The solution to getting students to graduate on time is not to water down our education so we take less classes, but to offer more classes at all times of the day so students can take them on time and be able to graduate on time. Free the CSU from debt, from whitewashing, and from cuts that limit student success. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Asia Gonzalez and I am a student in Cal State Long Beach and I am also a member of SQE. My stay is in response to the email sent out by Chancellor White. Words are nice and all, but what we need even more of is action. It was especially disappointing to read how ready the, readily the Chancellor was to give up on his DACA staff and rally light. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it was especially disappointing to read how readily the chancellor was to give up on his DACA staff and rely solely on con Congress for solutions. Undocumented students and staff are out here fear fearful of their uncertain futures and we need to assure them that there are proactive steps taken to keep them safe from deportations and other harassments. The UCs have decided to sue Trump and the federal government for their attacks on undocumented students. When is the CSU going to join in true allyship? A few individual campuses have already taken action, but it should be a CSU universal act to pay for the renewal fees for the students' um, DACA renewals um, and their students' and staff's DACA applications and provide resource to, resources to dream centers that exist and create dream centers where they don't. Furthermore, there needs to be action taken to protect and provide resources to undocumented students who are not eligible for DACA. We need to have scholarships dedicated to those folks alone and claim the CSU campuses as sanctuary. Good morning again, Pat Gant, President, California State University Employees Union. Um, I've uh, given this uh, trustee secretary a uh, flyer for the trustees that sort of outlines what we think a fair contract is as we're in negotiations along with the other unions. Uh, over the last day and, and this morning, you've heard of concerns from many of the unions about bargaining and uh, compensation. Uh, we uh, congratulate the presidents on their recent raise but you have the opportunity now to put the money on the table for all the bargaining units and unions to negotiate fair contracts. You have the opportunity here because of the leadership position in this room you have, you can do that. You can also take that position and continue to support the DACA individuals in the campus communities to make sure that the campus is a safe place for everybody and you can act proactively much like the UC did to protect DACA individuals. There's other alternatives that you can do to also protect them, but we can discuss that offline. So in your leadership position, whether it's DACA or collective bargaining agreements, we can all work together to change tomorrow. This proven a year ago, when we all locked arms and joined hands, we were able to fully fund the CSU. It's not easy, it's hard work, collaboration is always a challenge. When we work together, the CSU is better and we all are better. So I encourage you to settle the contracts and work with the unions to make the CSU the strongest place possible and fund the master plan. Rafi Sanchez, Neil Jacklin, Catherine Hutchinson, Tessie Reese, and Mike Chavez, in any order. 
I'm Rocky Sanchez, VP for Representation CSUEU, 25-year employee of Cal Poly Pomona. In my previous speech, I brought up the fact that uh, you view us as if we're second-class employees. Actually, that is true, but it's also true that in the past you viewed us as children, the good children, the children who would not rise up and question your authority, your, your reasoning for what you did. Well, we're here now, we're grown-ups. We expect to be treated with respect at the bargaining table when we're here and when we're at work. We wish to be treated courteously and with civility. Unfortunately, because you choose not to deal with us, because you still view, view us as children, we are mistreated and we are not respected. But we're here to let you know, as grown-ups, what our expectations are and what our demands are and what we are entitled to. Respect, a fair contract, and to be treated decently. Thank you. Good morning again. Uh, very concerned about uh, bargaining and our contract. But I'd like to take this moment uh, to address Stanislaus' newest uh, president, Alan Jun. Uh, my colleagues and friends at uh, Stanislaus would like to welcome you to our university. We are honored and proud to have such a gifted administrator, administrator as our president. As a staff member at Stanislaus, I would like to thank you, President John, for your honesty, communication, vision, and dedication to all the members at Stanislaus and the surrounding community. Welcome. My name's uh, Catherine Hutchinson, a CSU VP of Finance and uh, Instructional Support Tech of Biology at CSU Channel Islands. And I just wanted to, to this morning the compensation got approved and the question was asked why that percentage and it was for parity and to be competitive. And that's what the staff wants to. In fact, the CSU did market value and saw that we are below market value. And so all we're asking is that we're brought up to be market, to be competitive. A lot of us know we can leave and go get those jobs and salaries, but we love the CSU, we love the students, we love working for you guys. That's why we're here, that's why we're 14, 20 years, 50 years, 30 years plus people. So we're just asking for you guys to show parity with us and staff and invest in the working people of this issue. Thank you. John? Hi, Tessie Reese again. Um, Unit two chair, Long San Diego. I'm moving to Long Beach, I guess, San Diego State. I wanted to just say my 60 seconds here with, I am health support. So I want to plug the 500 and some people that I represent. We do an awesome job in our health centers. We do mental health, well-being, and all health of our students. So when I hear mental health, I want you all to remember that usually the first time the students come in for that concern is us, the Student Health Center. So keep it in mind that we also are the first and front line of the. I also want to plug my athletic trainers because they are the unsung heroes of your student athletes. They are the moms and the dads of these athletes. They put them to bed, they take them to the doctor, and they take them to the store. So while we applaud our athletes and our campuses and our presidents, keep in mind it's your athletic trainers, not the coaches, not the directors, but your athletic trainers who are the ones that keep them safe. Thank you. Hello all, my name is Mike Chavez, Chair Unified CSUEU. Over the course of the past two days, I think you heard all of our messages. We asked you to hear us and listen to us. I think the message has gotten to you guys. You guys have heard us. Hopefully you guys have heard us. We have a few bargaining sessions that are up. So we look forward to collaboratively, collaboratively working with you guys so you guys can give us a fair and just contract. Thank you. Carolyn Duckett, Rosa Jones, Ricardo Ook.
Good morning again, Carolyn Duckett, 23 year employee here at the Chancellor's Office, and I love the Chancellor's Office. That's why I've been here a long time. <laughs> Chancellor White, we do appreciate you, and we want you to honestly be fair with us at the table. Unit 7 has really suffered. Um, there's really nowhere to go. Most of our employees who are hired in are at the low salary. A lot of them have bachelor degrees and master degrees, Unit 7s, and they're paid very low. So we're asking you to hear us at the table. Um, I would like to read the preamble that was turned down, that was rejected by management. And I would like to say this, we believe in the right to a competitive compensation structure with predictable movement through the salary schedule. We believe that employees should, be, should have an established career path and recognize knowledge, service, and skills. We believe in transparency and fairness when it comes to bargaining. We know that this will affect all employees and staff. Thank you. My name is Ricardo Uc, Vice Chair, Unit 9, CSUEU. With many years of service, the economic hardships faced by represented employees with little or no movement through the salary range in, in, is the inability to keep up with inflation. Very early on, your chief negotiator at the bargaining table said that in some campuses, custodial staff make more money than the city around them. It's easy for you to say when you're making $21,000 a month. This can set with many years of service, this can be sadly seen as a penalty for many years of continuous service. To quote Chancellor White, try to focus on the needs of others and not yourself. A little more focus should be shed on all union represented employees regarding compensation and benefits. I hope you're listening to me and not with deliberate indifference. Thank you. Hector Fernandez, Jason Rabanowitz, Chris Rofera, and Doug Frame. Hi, Hector Fernandez with SETC. Uh, I'd actually like everybody to uh, do me a favor and take a minute. If you can stop typing on your computers, put your pens down. Take a look at the audience. I'd like all my brothers and sisters from every union to stand up right now. Everybody in the audience that is represented by a union, CSUEU, APC, everybody. I think the message has been loud and clear throughout every single board of trustees. We want fair contracts. We want to be paid what we're worth. And we want to be valued in this system. Every single one of us, I appreciate Mr. Day's comments. I understand budgets are limited and we got to work with financial restraints but we also face at the table being told that we're presented with proposals that were overpaid, that were in the compensation pools that we should be compared to market value, yet every single one in this room knows we're not. And I think that's where we want to be treated fairly. We want to come to the table, we want to be respected, we want to understand that when we receive a proposal or a research data, that it's trustworthy and that it's not told it's proprietary and we can't give out the information of where we got it. That is what every single union has been told, and that's not what we're trying to do here. We expect respect, and we hope everyone in this room will give us that moving forward as we move through collective bargaining. Thank you. Yeah. Treasurer, Teamsters Local 2010, and I think I'm pulling time from Chris Profera and, uh, Chris and Drew. And Drew. Um, so, uh, uh, Chancellor White, trustees, uh, I bring you greetings from Teamsters Local 2010, representing close to 15,000 workers in higher education in California, um, and now including over 1,000 skilled trades workers at the California State University, whose hard work makes Cal State work every day. And I'd like to ask our Teamster uh, brothers and sisters here to stand up and be recognized. Yeah. Put on your cap if you've got it. So um, we are very proud 
that the members of the State Employee Trade Council voted overwhelmingly by 75% to affiliate with Teamsters Local 2010. And now we look forward to working with you, Board of Trustees, um, to a long and productive collective bargaining relationship that benefits the university system, the students, uh, but that also benefits the workers whose hard work makes the university work every day, that benefits our communities and our state by providing good jobs and fair wages and benefits uh, to the workers throughout the, the Cal State system. And I want you to know that Teamsters 2010 has a long uh, and strong history and track record of fighting hard, bringing our substantial power to bear in support of public higher education. See, we believe that higher education in our state ought to be affordable, ought to be funded adequately. And so we look forward to partnering with you towards that end. But at the same time, we need to make sure that the workers whose hard work makes Cal State work are treated fairly and compensated fairly for what they do. Because Cal State is not only one of the leading educational institutions in the state, it's also an economic force in our state. One of the largest employers, 50,000 employees, supporting directly 150,000 jobs in our uh, communities with related expenditures of $17 billion. So what Cal State does as an economic actor, how it treats its workforce, has an impact on the health of our communities and our entire state. And if we want to succeed as a university and as a state, we need to make sure that we are creating, supporting, and maintaining good jobs in our communities, treating our workers fairly for the work that they do. Now, we are in reopener negotiations. We look forward to working with you. Uh, we'll also be in successor negotiations for our contract in 2019. There are very important issues that we need to take up together. We need to make sure that our workers are fairly compensated for the work that they do. We need to make sure that we protect our benefits, our retirement, and our medical coverage, because that's one of the most important reasons that so many give their lives and their careers to serve this institution. We need to make sure that we're adequ adequately staffed, uh, and we need to address workload issues here at Cal State. We also need to address wasteful contracting out uh, of work that should be performed by our loyal Cal State workforce, okay? So we look forward to working with you and Teamsters, um, just in case to make sure that the trustees remember who we are. Teamsters! Who, who are we? Teamsters! Who are we? Teamsters! All right, thank you everybody. We look forward to working with you productively in the future. So our last four speakers, again, Doug Frame, Dennis Sotomayor, Ron Williams, and Frank Garcia. Good morning. My name is Ali Tweeney, unapologetically and proud Teamsters member because the organization that I represent stands for fairness, equality, and justice to all. Greeting to all of you. I'm a third generation product of this institution. My uncle graduated from Cal State LA in 1957 in business and economics. I went in the 90s. My son just started Cal State LA. This should continue to be an affordable higher education institution. We're standing in solidarity with the members that affiliated with the Teamsters Local 2010 and all workers in the state of California. Because through labor, everything can happen. Miracles can happen. Those people who work hard every day, they love what they do. And when you love life through labor, you'll be intimate with life's inmost secret. Please do good by the people. And I promise to all of you who sit sitting here that the process of the compensation will go as smooth as it went for the president and the chancellors as you've seen it. Thank you. Uh, good morning, my name is Reggie Castro. I'm from Cal State Northridge. I have 33 Gentlemen, of... I'm just gonna stop you for just a moment. This time is for those who have requested to speak. If you're not on my list, you can see me afterwards and we'll make sure that you're on next time. The ones who are on my list again are Doug Frame, Dennis Sotomayor, Ron Williams, and Frank Garcia. Uh, my, Reggie, my name is Reggie Castro again. I am replacing Doug Frame. 
I'm from Cal State Northridge. I have 33 years of loyal service. Uh, Chancellor White, congratulations on your increase. Campus presidents, congratulations on your increases. Uh, it normally takes us through IRPs, general salary increases upon our request, usually takes us six months uh, to get a response. Congratulations. Two things that I'd like to say is, I've been very fortunate these last couple of months to visit some of your campuses, beautiful campuses. Uh, two issues that have come up. One is salary increases and being understaffed. Um, one of the things that I found is they can't all be wrong because they're all speaking of the same thing. Now, getting back to Jock, the problem with Jock is is you're asking us to do our regular maintenance during our regular work day. Once Jock leaves, we have to go back and repair what they didn't do properly. Now you guys have hired us to do our jobs. You've hired the best. They have invested their time in performing their duties so that when you have visitors and we have additional students coming in, our campuses, our campuses are presentable. We're not asking for anything that we believe uh, we want for free. We want what to be paid a decent wage for what you're asking us to do. Thank you, Mr. Castro. Your time has expired. The other thing is, I'm going to ask you to please yield the mic the, to the next speaker. The the increase of buildings that are going up. Fantastic. What you're forgetting to do is increase the staffing level to maintain those buildings. That's what we are asking for. To please take a look at that and pay us a decent wage for what you're asking us to do. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Eisen, that concludes the public comment period. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kiss. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. I want to uh, echo what uh, Vice Chair Day said. We do appreciate you coming. We do appreciate the information that you provide us. We do consider what you say to us. Um, it's now time to move to the board chair report, which is mine. This time last year, I spoke about how exciting September is uh, because it's the start of the new year and there's always a kind of buzz in the air. Uh, we definitely have that same electricity this year, but I don't think any of us would quarrel with the fact that this past year has been exceptionally eventful and exceptionally difficult. Uh, in just the last two months since our July, uh, July board meeting, we have collectively experienced Charlottesville, the Barcelona attack, another attack in London, hurricanes Harvey and Irma, two devastating earthquakes in Mexico, and of course the abominable rescission of DACA. And as you've just heard from at least one of the public speakers, uh, there have been personal tragedies as well. I wanna take just one moment to thank uh, Char Charmaine Lawson who came here today uh, and told us the story of her son, a Humboldt State student. I wanna thank her for her courage in coming today. Um, all of these events, uh, as hard as they are, remind us of the leadership role education plays in changing the world for the better. And that reflection always makes me feel, and I'm sure all of you feel proud of the community that is the CSU. Um, and particularly with respect to DACA, we are reminded that the impactful leadership that we enjoy in our chancellor, thank you, chancellor, and all of our presidents, um, in our students, in our faculty and staff who all have come together uh, in light of this terrible decision. Um, and the board as well, I'm proud to say the board as well. 
Unlike some of the other catastrophes we've experienced, the DACA decision can be turned into a success story if we all work together. And I say to you, let's make it so. Um, on a different note, uh, we had one other truly cosmic event uh, occur during the past few months, uh, what was known as the Great American Eclipse. Um, and I have to tell you, somehow this event captured the spirit of millions of Americans, gave us one day of sweet respite from the barrage of negativity we've been experiencing. I uh, went with my husband, 11 and a half hours in the car, a lot of crossword puzzles and podcasts, uh, to get to Ketchum, Idaho, to see what I hope will not be just a once in a lifetime experience. I learned, uh, using my lifelong learning skills, uh, a lot about eclipses. It is the most amazing and infinitesimally small coincidence that we ever see a total eclipse. The moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but it happens to be 400 times closer to us than the sun. And because of those two uh, data points, one can obscure the other. I also learned that the moon is actually moving away from us. So, uh, you know, see them while you can, because it's not going to last forever. Um, I learned that the pilgrimage, and it honestly felt a bit like a pilgrimage, of millions of Americans to get into the path of totality was the largest mass migration of humans ever. Ever. <laughs> Isn't that an unbelievable statistic? Um, and of course, I learned that whenever something of this magnitude is happening, the CSU is all over it. Uh, I read with uh, great interest the excellent informational web page that was developed by the Department of Physics at Sacramento State, where they also held a viewing party of the eclipse. Oh, I love looking at that picture, that diamond ring picture. Uh, I saw that Chico State got all of their stakeholders in the act. They held a viewing party on the first day of classes, hosted by several professors, accompanied by music streaming from Trinity Tower, which I understand was curated by the College of Humanities and Fine Arts. Um, Cal State Dominguez Hills physics professor, Jimena Sid stood on the path of totality in Idaho, which I think means she was pretty close to where I was. This was a must do for Professor Sid as her personal mission is to expand STEM and physics curriculum to more students. Prior to the eclipse, Professor Sid taught a lab course in Dominguez Hills Summer Bridge Academy, focusing on why eclipses occur and the larger questions involving astronomy. Professor Sid said that, quote, when a student stares at the countless galaxies in a Hubble telescope, it is just pure wonder. You can feel their excitement. And I think that's well said, Professor Sid. Cal Poly Pomona professor Dr. David Nagjiri traveled to the Grand Tetons to replicate an experiment that was done in 1919 uh, an experiment that was designed to ascertain whether Einstein's prediction of 1914 was actually true. Does gravity bend light? Uh, and using the total eclipse, they were able to ascertain in 1919 that it was absolutely accurate. The gravity of the sun bent the light of the stars. Dr. Nagjiri was one of the very few institutions, we are one of the very few institutions, that replicated this experiment uh, in uh, 2017. So uh, it is uh, a great pleasure to be one of the elite that made this happen once again. Uh, and finally, I had the great pleasure on my way up to Idaho to speak with Dr. Matthew Povich, who is a professor of astronomy at Cal Poly Pomona. He led this team of students that you're looking at on the screen and alumni all the way up to Stanley, Idaho, which was literally in the center of the path of totality. And these students and Dr. Povich captured these amazing images. I want to show you some of the images our students collected. Uh, wow, that's a National Geographic work there. Um, 
Now, knowing the CSU, I'm pretty sure somebody's already working on the Chilean uh, eclipse that will occur in 2019. And when professors uh, head that way, please give me a call. I may not be on the board then, but I want to go with you. <laughs> um, you know, James Fenimore Cooper, who, of course, wrote The Last of the Mohicans, he witnessed an eclipse in 1806, more than 200 years ago. It was known as uh, Tecumseh's Eclipse. And he had these words to say, which uh, certainly captured the way I felt. He said, I have passed a varied and eventful life, that it has been my fortune to see earth, heavens, ocean, and man in most of their aspects, but never have I beheld any spectacle which so plainly manifested the majesty of the creator or so, or so forcibly taught the lesson of humility to man as a total eclipse of the sun. I don't think I need to hear that song anymore, but uh, <laughs> it's a wonderful uh, quote. Um, so I want to congratulate the CSU, as always, for its uh, massive and impactful participation in what I thought was a truly ineffable moment. Uh, ineffable is one of those words I'm always dying to use. So this is one of the few times you could really use it. Um, a few more accolades and informational items uh, flying down to Long Beach. I came across, of course, this uh, in my little Southwest magazine. Where's my slide? <laughs> you know, I told the flight attendant that I knew the guy in this uh, picture, and uh, I was thinking maybe I could get an extra bag of peanuts out of it, but uh, that didn't work. Um, I do think it's appropriate that the uh, chancellor has his Superman CSU cape on, uh, because his efforts on behalf of our DACA students and employees has truly been heroic. And uh, from your grateful board, I want to thank you, Chancellor White. Um, Finally, although it, uh, um, well, A, I want to congratulate, oh, look at this. What is this? Water. Water. First, I want to thank the Alumni Council for giving me this uh, uh, not bottled water. Uh, the note says, Ch uh, Chair Eisen, you've inspired us to ditch plastic water bottles at all our meetings. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank the chancellor and his team for their leadership in making the chancellor's office where we all sit and all of its floors and conference rooms plastic water bottle free. Water coolers have been installed, marine life is being saved, and our carbon footprint is being reduced. Uh, and it could not be more timely. I'm sure many of you saw the recent study demonstrating that each and every one of us is ingesting plastic now every time we eat seafood and drink water because of the permeation of our water systems because of plastic water bottles. Um, presidents, I can't wait for one of you to call me up and tell me that your camp campus has accomplished the exact same goal. Now, it saddens me to say that Dr. Horace Mitchell has announced his intention to retire from the CSU. You still have time to change your mind. <laughs> we will have time left this year to toast and roast Taurus, and I want to mention just a few key points from his incredible 14-year legacy with the CSU and the Bakersfield community. Um, under Horace's leadership, Cal State Bakersfield reached record highs in both enrollment and graduation rates. In the months to come, we will be, oops, I forgot one. Uh, Dr. Mitchell enhanced the academic quality of the university, adding new academic programs with outstanding and world-class faculty and staff. We can't hear enough these days about Bakersfield. Uh, gained NCAA Division I status in athletics. This is all under Dr. Mitchell's leadership. Uh, and much, much more, which all in some have profoundly and positively altered the lives of tens of thousands of students and their families in the region that was underserved for far too long. We want to thank you for 
everything you've done for the CSU, for Cal State Bakersfield, for the Central Valley, and for public higher education in California. Thank you so much. months to come, we are going to be working hard to find a new leader for Bakersfield, but I will not say replacement. That is impossible. Uh, we will update this board and the Cal State Bakersfield community with more information as it becomes available. Trustee Nylon will serve as uh, chair of the search committee, uh, and there's likely no one here besides Horace who knows the needs and uh, the opportunities of the Kern County region better. Thank you, Trustee Nylon. Uh, joining John on the committee will be Trustee Reyes Salinas, thank you so much, Trustee Carney, and Trustee Taylor. It will be a great committee. That concludes my report. Chancellor White. Well, thank you, Chair Eisen. And I, like you, uh, was disheartened to learn that the DACA was being rescinded in six months pending congressional action to put its provisions into legislation. And I and our team immediately turned our attention to triage and to permanent solutions. As we know and have discussed during the course of this meeting and so many other times, we have met countless DACA students, heard their stories and celebrated their achievements. And we have hired hundreds of DACA employees who contribute to our university's mission each day. These incredible young people whose determination and brilliance in their academic and career pursuits is matched only by their courage to come forward in spite of incredible risks to them and to their families. And each and every time I meet a dreamer, I am reminded of and grateful for my own immigrant story. While my immigration status was different six decades ago, I knew the incredible challenges that my parents overcame then to get us out of Argentina and eventually to California. I also know that at the age of nine, I had no say in the matter. My parents did what they had to do, and I'm forever thankful that they did. And like our dreamers today, I am grateful to be an active part of this state and of this nation. Certainly, many of our Dreamer students, alumni and employees brought to the United States as young children know no other country than this one. This country, our country, is their country too. They have pledged allegiance to our flag and they have paid their taxes. They've enlisted, they have fought, and they have died for our country and our values. They have built businesses, purchased homes, and given back to their communities. They have in queue to represent the California spirit and the American dream. So to our DACA students and employees, to our dreamers, please know that the California State University remains in steadfast support of you and your academic and career goals. This support is unwavering. It is my personal commitment, and as chancellor, I also speak for the California State University. In discussion with our trustees, they too are unanimous in support of you, as are the 23 presidents and six vice chancellors and their staffs. I also want to thank the CSSA, I want to thank the Academic Senate and labor leadership and the many thousands of CSU students, faculty, staff, and alumni and friends who have come together to speak out in unison in support of our dreamers and to take action. Indeed, I shared many of the stories and contributions of DACA students, alumni, and employees with members of California's congressional delegation and the Department of Education in Washington, D.C. just last week. And I'm pleased that many of the elected leaders I spoke to on both sides of the aisle recognize that DACA recipients are valued members of our university, state, and nation, and that congressional action is needed now. I also want to thank Governor Brown and California's elected leaders for their quick response and support of our Dreamer students. Together, our shared message is we will always support you. And as we move together, it is also our responsibility to make sure that CSU and its campuses serve as accurate, timely clearinghouses for information relevant to our DACA students and employees. As more information and resources become available, 
The CSU and its 23 campuses will utilize every communications and outreach tool available to get the word out. But so for everybody here today, please again, take note of this vital information and share it with all those who need it. First, DACA status and work permits are valid until their respective expiration dates. Second, while currently no new DACA applications are being accepted, existing DACA issuances and work permits that expire before March 5th, 2018 must be submitted for renewal next month, no later than October 5th, so that these individuals can get a two-year renewal of their status. October 5th, please remember that date. This fast approaching deadline requires all hands on deck to help identify our students and employees who qualify for renewal. I urge you to let your colleagues, coworkers, friends, and family know. Don't wait. Don't wait till the fourth. <laughs> Get in front of the line. Financial assistance is available through the state on many of our campuses and through private organizations to pay the $495 application fee. Don't let $495 get in the way. More information can be found on calstate.edu. Third, if you leave the country currently through advanced parole, the Department of Homeland Security will no longer grant you permission to re-enter, regardless of your DACA status. And fourth and lastly, I encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. To our DACA students, attend class, go to work, apply for internships, join research projects, Support your siblings, parents, family, friends, and all others who need your support, strength, and guidance. Continue to excel in your studies. Inspire others to succeed. Change minds. Ignore the haters and graduate. And in this spirit of social and economic ascent that the CSU provides to our DACA students, indeed to all of our students on all of our campuses, I ask that you view this short video by Vox. It is based now, and please go ahead and tee it up. It is based now on the now famous Stanford study on colleges being engines of upward mobility that came out earlier this year. Led by economist Rad Shetty and contributed to by colleagues from around the nation. Justin, please roll the video. Elite universities love to market themselves as engines of upward mobility. Elite and egalitarian. And for low-income students, they do offer incredibly generous financial aid. I found out that for a family like ours, we wouldn't have to worry about affording Harvard. I'm really grateful because I wouldn't have been able to get here were it not for the amazing financial aid package I received. Thanks to some new economic data, we can now see just how good these colleges actually are at lifting students out of poverty. And when we do, the results aren't what you'd expect. A group of economists looked at two sets of records, income tax forms from the IRS and graduation data from the Department of Education, with all the identifying information taken out. They looked at 10.8 million people born between 1980 and 1982. The tax forms showed how much money their families made, and the researchers placed each person in a group based on that income, from the bottom 20%, whose families made about $25,000 or less per year, to the top 20%, whose families made about $110,000 or more per year. They looked at where each person went to college and how their position on the income ladder changed about 10 years after graduation. If you look at kids from the bottom 20% who go to elite colleges like Harvard, they do really well. Over half of them go from families in the poorest fifth of the American economy to being in the top fifth by the time they're in their mid-30s. Same thing at Stanford, Yale, and Princeton. The problem is, these schools don't let in very many kids from the bottom rung of the ladder. In the class of 2013, only 4.5% of Harvard students came from the bottom 20% of the income distribution. So about a fourth as many people as you would expect if Harvard were representing the American population. Testing data show there are plenty of qualified low-income students out there. They're just not applying to elite schools. Many, many, many more people who were born into privilege and have wealthy families get to go to these places. Then there are colleges with the opposite problem, like Moultrie Technical College in Georgia. 34% of their students came from the bottom rung of the ladder. It's really good at access. 
but a very small fraction of them make it to the top fifth of the income distribution. But there are some schools who are good at both. Cal State LA. It's a commuter school. It's enrolling a lot, a lot, a lot of poor kids. 20% of students come from the bottom rung of the ladder, and half of them end up at the top rung. Pace University in New York, which does a little worse on access. 10% of its students come from the bottom rung of the ladder. But well over half of them wind up in the top 20%. David Leonhardt at the New York Times refers to them as America's great working class colleges. And I really like that saying that they're not the famous ones. They're not the ones that get a lot of press coverage or get represented in movies. There's no social network about Cal State LA, but they're doing the work. So Chair Eisen, while that video focused and highlighted uh, the wonderful work at Cal State Los Angeles, it actually is reflective of the work on all 23 campuses. And to that I say to the presidents and the faculty and staff, thank you. And to our students, DACA or not, the California State University is the mechanism by which we ascend both economically and socially into an increasingly complex and divided world. That concludes my remarks. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Uh, we'll now have the report of the Academic Senate. Uh, Chair Miller. Thank you, Chair Eisen. I'm pleased to provide a report on last week's meetings of the Academic Senate CSU. And I'm pausing for the PowerPoint because I'm going to make reference to it once it appears on the screen. Here you see a picture of this year's Senate. They look like a happy bunch, but our meetings were not all sunshine and blue skies. More on that later. As you've come to expect from me, I have a theme. The theme for this report is time. Remember these red watches from last year's advocacy campaign? I gave you a gift last time. Pretend I gave this to you, and you have it on right now. If you think about it, time has many properties. We can think of time as motion, where it passes, marches, stands still, or flies when you're having fun. We can also think about time as manifest in objects, like time bombs, time machines, and time clocks. And of course, we often talk about time as a commodity, which can be invested or wasted. It was easy to choose time as a theme because time dominated the Senate's discussions last week. The first resolution we passed by acclamation illustrates the passing of time. Next slide. Unfortunately, it commemorates the passing of Professor Emeritus Len Mathy, CSU LA Professor of Economics from 1950 to 1986. He was the first chair of ASCSU in 1963. I was a toddler when he held my current position, but I and all other CSU faculty owe him a debt of gratitude. I'll read one of the clauses in our resolution so you can see what I mean. In his capacity as chair of the ASCSU, Professor Mathy fought for effective and timely consultation with faculty, the protection of faculty authority, and demonstrated his dedication to ensuring the independence of faculty in shared governance by helping defeat a proposal that the chancellor be chair of ASCSU. What a different world this would be if that proposal had passed. I'm honored to carry on his legacy as ASCSU chair, and the Senate sends its condolences to his family. Next slide. From time passing to the notion of investing time, next slide, Justin, the second resolution approved unanimously by the, by the Senate is in support of the preservation and extension of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA program. DACA is time well spent on a population of students whose education will pay dividends, and the CSU should continue to do everything it can to preserve and extend the program. The resolution articulates some specific steps to ensure that DACA students continue to have access to higher education opportunities in the CSU. It supports the actions taken by Central Federation, the campuses, and the California State Legislature to do so, and it encourages U.S. Senators and Representatives to pass federal legislation that provides DACA protections. There are over 800,000 students in the state of California whose lives and livelihoods are affected by investing time in their education, and it's definitely time well spent. Next slide. 
While I'm talking about legislation, the statewide Senate also took a position supporting another bill that we think is a good investment of time and resources, AB 19, which now sits on Governor Brown's desk. This bill allows community colleges to waive fees for first-time students enrolled in at least 12 units of classes for their first year. If this law can, in, can decrease student debt and increase access to education, then the Senate thinks it will certainly be time and money well spent. Speaking of time, the last resolution I'm going to talk to you about has some history behind it. Next slide. Because I know Chair Eisen is an avid bird watcher, I'll use this beautiful canary to explain the history. If you've ever heard the expression canary in a coal mine, you know that miners used to take these cute little birds down into the tunnels with them, and if dangerous gases such as carbon monoxide collected in the mine, the gases would kill the bird before the miners. So they were an early indicator of danger or failure. Next slide. Well, for a few months now, I've been calling myself the canary in the coal mine. I've been warning people that the faculty I represent are gasping for air and that shared governance is suffering. I've been warning you too. In May, when I developed my balance theme, I said this, my plea is for time, time to think, time to talk, time to respond appropriately. The single biggest complaint I've heard from faculty all across the system is that deadlines are way too short for the kind of thoughtful input they'd like to give. We can't even catch our breath. To cite just a few examples, between general education requests, executive order drafts, intellectual property policy review, and the breakneck speed at which changes to academic preparation are happening, faculty are asking a very important question. Do you want it fast or do you want it right? Then in July, remember those fidget spinners? I talked about how faculty are in danger of spinning out of control. I said if the direction of the spin is the same and we're all going forward in the same direction, everything will be fine. But if faculty think that shared governance processes are not being honored, the trajectory of the spin will change. We'll spin backward and no one wants that. I told you when shared governance slows or worse when it stops and goes backward, Students ultimately suffer, and students are why we are all here. So during the last academic year, I was your canary on the left. This year, on your right, I bring you AS 3304 on the development and implementation of Executive Orders 1100 revised and 1110. The subject of this resolution, those executive orders, dominated, and I mean dominated, Senate discussion last week. Beginning on Tuesday, in the Chancellor's own General Education Advisory Committee, and carrying all the way through Friday afternoon, Senators debated what to say about them. The Chancellor's GE Advisory Committee, which includes members from the California Community Colleges, unanimously supported a resolution directing their chair to tell, the, to tell Chancellor White what they had discussed and to request an extension of the implementation timeline uh, for deadline for these uh, executive orders. On Wednesday, each one of the state, statewide Senate's four committees wrote at least one resolution opposing the executive orders. So on Thursday, the chairs of those committees did outstanding work blending them together into one resolution. On Friday, senators had an extremely thoughtful, respectful, reasoned, and passionate debate on whether to request that the EOs be rescinded entirely or just held in abeyance for a year. When all was said and done, we chose the latter course of action. More on that in a moment. First, I want to give you more history, which explains why I resemble that canary on the right. You should know that ASCSU has adopted a theme for its work this year, and that theme is collective voice. In that spirit, I want you to hear what campus Senate chairs are saying about EOs 1100 and 1110. So it's not just statewide senators who are upset by these EOs and their timeline, it's faculty on the campuses too. Next slide. The quotes on this slide represent the idea of time travel. Senate chairs say, the timeline is a problem as changes need to be made quickly without full discussion and reflection. This will negate any improvements that campuses may, may have made in recent years. Next, it took us years to devise our policy. The CO is now asking us to change it in a matter of weeks. The pushback is not as much about the required changes, but about the timeline, which is impossible. The first quote says the timeline negates forward progress, and the second says it's impossible to construct in weeks what took years to develop. There are no time machines to fix this. 
Next slide. A time bomb seems to be an appropriate characterization for these comments by Senate chairs. The tight time frame for faculty feedback is a mockery of a consultative process. Next, it has a potential, de I'm sorry, a potent destabilizing effect and interferes with every step of our process. Next, they ordered change, the ordered changes really upend our curriculum. The changes will touch nearly every department. Next, the revisions will impact every area of GE and the careful integration of major and GE requirements. You can tell these chairs are frustrated, so my time bomb caricature reflects that. Next slide. This caricature looks a little bit more worried, which captures several of the campus comments. They say, not only do the revisions affect every GE area, but cascading resource and programmatic effects will impact a majority of majors and minors. Next, there are potential implications for lecturers who teach the lion's share of GE courses, including loss of work, effects on entitlements, and increased workload to revise existing courses. Next, there will be a great deal of infrastructure work, updating advising materials for all departments, updating websites, rewriting policies, etc. Finally, these EOs could significantly harm morale and the working relationship between faculty and campus administration. Remember, I'm your system-wide canary. Please don't discount what the campus canaries are saying about morale and working relationships. In addition, please notice they are all singing the same tune. They need more time. Next slide. I offer you this last comment because it provides a useful reminder about how clocks can stop. This chair notes, in the EO 1110 FAQs, the response to the timeline is that it would be difficult to justify delaying the benefits afforded by these policy changes. But by delaying a year, the worst scenario for students is that they would have, a, have to petition to change their catalog rights if they like the new version better. That's not a big burden if it means getting things right. I would add that this can be done very easily with just the check of a box. You see, time can stand still for students. If they benefit by the new rules, they can ask to follow them. In the meantime, with a new deadline, faculty will have the time they need to get things right. That's why the statewide Senate is asking Chancellor White to call a timeout. Next slide. I'll give my daughter credit for that. We point out in our resolution that the shared governance which took place surrounding these EOs was severely time constrained and flawed, contrary to the practice of joint decision making mandated in HERA. So we request a timeout until at least fall of 2019. In addition, we think before restarting the game again, the chancellor and his team should engage in data driven and genuine consultation with faculty, which would include the following. Analysis of the costs of modifying GE and academic preparation curricula. Analysis of the effect of, on, of, of campus level I'm sorry, analysis of the effect on campus level resource allocation and its impact on specific programs such as ethnic and cultural and diversity studies. Reinstating recent moratorium on changes in ethnic studies programs until at least fall of 2019. Ensuring that multiple measures are used to assess foundational quantitative reasoning proficiency and collaboration between the Chancellor's Office and the ASCSU to develop a plan for monitoring the efficacy of changes in GE and academic preparation curricula. These requests are entirely consistent with what the editorial board of the LA Times called for on Monday. They wrote, in the end, it can be easy to raise graduation rates if that's the only goal, just lower standards. Cal State trustees should insist on regular independent audits of these new policies to ensure that the education they're providing isn't being cheapened. We agree with these sentiments and stand ready to engage in data-driven decision-making and genuine consultation about them. Speaking of what the media is saying about all this, an article in EdSource says faculty are rebelling. However, to quote one of our senators, I think calling this a rebellion is a stretch. We're not rebelling. We're asking for the time and the resources to do the job entrusted to us. So Chancellor White has heard calls for a timeout from his own General Education Advisory Committee, from the CSU Academic Senate, from faculty and ethnic studies, 
from the President of the Emeritus and Retired Faculty Association, and from you indirectly in the form of a request by Trustee Stepanek to discuss it at your November meeting. I really hope, though, that he blows the whistle now, before November. If he doesn't, I urge you to seriously consider taking action yourselves to call a timeout. Time is of the essence. Chair Eisen, that completes my reports, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chair Miller. We'll now have the report of the CSSA, President White. Thank you, Chair Eisen. Good morning, everyone. At the last board meeting, I spoke about the importance of partnerships with the Academic Senate, Alumni Council, CSU administration and staff, Board of Trustees, and students across the state. I'm excited that this theme of partnership has continued over the past few months. We recently returned from a trip to Washington, D.C., where we were able to partner with the Chancellor to discuss protections for our undocumented students, upholding the standards of Title IX to safeguard our survivors of sexual assault, and increasing the federal Pell Grant to meet the rate of inflation so that our students with the most need will not lose the purchasing power that they rely on to pay their tuition and fees. This past weekend, we held our monthly plenary meeting at Cal State Fullerton. Over the course of this meeting, Various committees and the Board of Directors discussed the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, more commonly referred to as DACA. Our student leaders shared their experiences and strategies and asked questions about ways to advocate for and with the students most affected by actions taken by our nation's president. CSSA also discussed strategies for action moving forward. Since the announcement was made about the rescission of DACA on September 5th of this year, CSSA has communicated the ever-changing landscape to students and the public through letters, statements, and calls to action, all of which can be found at our website, calstatestudents.org. It's clear that we must be united in our support for DACA recipients and do so by continuing to cultivate strong partnerships with each other and with the public. Although DACA was a main topic of discussion, many of our meetings, other important topics were covered as well. During a meeting in D.C. with James Manning, the Acting Undersecretary of Undercation, Title IX was discussed at length. We express interest in ensuring a system that is fair promotes the safety and well-being of victims and survivors of sexual violence on our campuses. Undersecretary Manning invited CSSA to provide formal feedback on student priorities relating to Title IX. So our board will be working hard to produce a white paper that outlines CSSA's key considerations for this important federal policy that ultimately impacts all of our 23 CSU campuses. I'd like to highlight the CSSA 2017-2018 public policy agenda, which was approved at our August Board of Directors meeting. This policy agenda is the result of much discussion, research, and communication with our student board of directors. I'd like to highlight the four priority areas we'll be focusing on throughout the year to come. Our first priority is to ensure that mental health resources are responsive to the distinct needs of the CSU system's diverse student body, which means not only working to ensure sufficient resources are available to our students, but that they are responsive to data that suggests that certain students are more deeply affected by these issues than others. Our second priority is to improve the affordability of higher education at the CSU and ensure that students' basic needs are being met which means not only addressing the ways in which tuition and fees factor into the price of college, but acknowledging that even our low-income students who receive financial aid are leaving our campuses with significant amounts of debt because they are struggling to afford all of the other costs of college life, including securing affordable housing and healthy meals. Our third priority is to promote safe and inclusive environments to ensure a positive campus climate for all CSU students which means respecting the constitutional rights of students while understanding that some students, such as students of color, LGBT and non-binary gender students and women, have disparate experiences on our campuses. And finally, our fourth priority is to promote equity in the academic success of CSU students, which acknowledges that every CSU student should have an equal chance to succeed, and that's currently just not the case. We encourage everyone in this room and watching this meeting online to view the details of this policy agenda, which can be found at calstatestudents.org. While this is not inclusive of all issues facing our students, we know that they are all important in our students' needs, and we will use this document as our guiding North Star to keep us focused on some of the most urgent issues facing our nearly half a million students across the state. 
More importantly, we ask that our partners and stakeholders, including the CSU Board of Trustees, refer to these policy priorities as you all make important decisions throughout the year that will impact the everyday lives of the students about whom you care so deeply. Thank you, Chair Eisen. That concludes my report. Thank you, President White. Uh, now we will have the report of the CSU Alumni Council, President Morales. Thank you, Chair Eisen. Uh, well, I wasn't going to start with this, but since you brought it up, I also went to the eclipse. Uh, I was at Madras, Oregon, uh, right in the totality. And I will tell you, I completely agree with the migration statistic because at seven hours to drive 70 miles after the eclipse, when everybody got in the same car at the, at the same exact time, uh, you know, Central Oregon and most of the path of the eclipse was not equipped for uh, the amount of people that showed up. Um, but two and a half minutes of life-changing experience um, absolutely will not miss uh, the next one. But uh, thanks for those amazing pictures because those really did illustrate it much better than my iPhone camera took. Um, it kind of looked ridiculous. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about, I wish I had a, a great theme and it was a great communicator like Chair Miller, but I'm not, so I'm just going to go for it. Um, we had our fall meeting a couple weeks ago at Channel Island, so special thanks to President Beck for hosting us. Your campus is amazing. Your staff was awesome. We happened to be there on move-in day, and I will tell you that the Alumni Council wants to move in there. Uh, Camarillo is a, a place to be, so <laughs> thank you so much for hosting us. We really appreciate it. Uh, as you probably remember, the focus of this meeting was career preparation. Uh, the Alumni Council has engaged in the grad initiative on those two fronts, career preparation and students' basic needs. Uh, so we were joined by several leaders from the campus career centers, which I think was very important because oftentimes career centers are organized in student affairs while alumni relations are organized in advancement. So to get that cl cross collaboration was very important. We heard really, really good programs and really great ideas, particularly from Cal State, Cal State LA, CSUN, Dominguez Hills, and Channel Islands. So um, they're doing some great work, and I think all the other campuses took had a lot to take back uh, to develop relationships. And sometimes it's as easy as walking over to the Career Center and introducing yourself. And uh, we had a lot of great examples of what we could do. I also wanted to thank Dr. James Minor and Marianne Jackman for being there. Uh, it really uh, means a lot to our academic, or our, excuse me, our alumni council to have a central office there to really explain, maybe demystify some of the myths that you might, might hear when you read about this um, proposal in the media. Uh, we really do appreciate that. And again, of course, to Dr. Blanchard, thank you for continuing to include us and we really look forward to having alumni representation on at least one of the pillars of uh, the grad initiative moving forward. Um, we're currently working on our next meeting, which will be held at uh, Cal Maritime in the spring. Very excited about that. We've got uh, already plans to go on the boat, so um, everybody's very excited to do that. Uh, that meeting will focus on students' basic needs. Uh, so we are hard at work trying to put together a program uh, that will really you know, have some meaningful takeaways on what we can really do as alumni to help students uh, that are really struggling. Uh, that was the meat of our meeting. I had two, two just kind of highlights that I wanted to also bring up. Chair Eisen, you mentioned the first. Um, I'm very excited. We surveyed our alumni board and had overwhelming support to begin the transition to a zero waste uh, type organization. Uh, you know, of course, as you know, that means not only reducing printouts, but it means replacing bottled water with either boxed water or even water pitchers and reusable glasses, washable, recyclable place settings for meals. I, I went to Humboldt State, so this is in my DNA. It's been something that we've been doing for a long time up there. So it was just a matter of time, but um, Chair Eisen, it was your leadership that really helped push us that direction. Uh, the second highlight um, is DACA. I know we've talked a lot about it today, and I'm very pleased to announce that at noon today, the Alumni Council will be releasing a statement supporting our DACA students and employees. Uh, first, we would, of course, want to thank the Chancellor at CSSA, their leadership for all that amazing work in D.C. last week. Uh, I followed it on social media. I was at regular work, um, but would have loved to be there. Um, you know, I, I think it's very clear that the CSU is leading in this area, and I think that's very, very important. So we are joining the other constituency organizations by releasing a statement. But I'd also want to say that beyond statements, resolutions are fantastic. But for those of those of us that really want to do something, uh, if you're an attorney like myself, or even if you're not, there are many, many opportunities to get out there and really help these students. Uh, the chancellor mentioned October 5th is a big day, so we've, we've got to do stuff now. 
All you really need to do is Google DACA help. Uh, law schools in all of your communities are really uh, kind of supporting all of this. Legal clinics, that's what they're there for. I was part of that when I was in law school and the demand for DACA was, was high then. And you can only imagine um, the amount of, of really truly worthy people that need to get their applications or their renewals in, excuse me, by uh, October 5th. So we're very happy to be supporting the CSU on that. Uh, you'll see the statement later today. Uh, that, uh, you know, maybe the one theme that we had this week was the Trustees Outstanding Achievement Award. That was amazing yesterday, meeting those 23 students, Chair Eisen, Maggie, those of us that were on that committee who read all the stories. The rest of you, you didn't hear the half of it. Um, you know, uh, you really do get emotional when you read those. All of the presidents, of course, know your individuals that you nominated, but reading 23 applications was an incredibly moving experience, and uh, yesterday was was amazing. So it's my pleasure today to introduce our alumni guest speaker, a 2010 recipient of the Outstanding Achievement Award, Tyree Boyd-Pates. He's a graduate of Cal State Bakersfield, so we talked about a Bakersfield theme. Uh, can't can't get enough of it. Uh, currently, he works as the history curator and program manager at the Cal California African American Museum here in Los Angeles. I uh, just oversaw the recent exhibition commemorating the 25th anniversary of the Los Angeles riots. Uh, he's also a contributor to Huffington Post Black Voices. And I think most important to this group, we're very fortunate to have him as part of our students' learning experience. He's a lecturer in Africana Studies at CSU Dominguez Hills. So I'll turn it over to Tyree to share a little bit of his story. Uh, greetings, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Um, it, it, it's very interesting what 10 years can do. <laughs> um, I'd like to give you guys a little bit of a, of a storyline of, of how I met um, a very important gentleman to my life, Dr. Horace Mitchell, um, and the ways in which CSU has informed my trajectory and my career. Um, as you all may will will learn um i am a, an angelino by by and large i grew up in koreatown and the first 15 years of my life was spent there um and while there um i navigated the los angeles public school uh system um uh, much to my dismay because uh when i uh, end, came to the end of my high school trajectory um i graduated high school with a 1.87 gpa now you're all probably asking, how did he get here? <laughs> um, and that's really the entry point. Um, Dr. Horace Mitchell at the same time in 2007 was involved with Super Soul Sundays, um, which was up and down um, California courting um, uh, black churches on outreach to uh, black students who may have been um, needing extra assistance, whether it be educational opportunity programs and the like. Um, what Dr. Horace Mitchell didn't know was that I was in those pews <laughs> and um, his efforts at West Angeles Church of God in Christ and the relationship that Cal State Bakersfield had built with that church would have lent me the opportunity to go um, to get a, a four year university education. So I want to give him some recognition for that. Um, as I embarked at Cal State Bakersfield and met Dr. Coley, who's also here, hi there, um, I uh, um, found myself there and, um, and I had a new lease on life. Um, I saw, I graduated 1.87 GPA, but I owed it to my community as well as Cal State Bakersfield to uh, make uh, an impact. And so uh, the first, my freshman year, unfortunately, my mother passed away. And so as uh, a, a legacy that I wanted to pay to her, I wanted to succeed. Um, by and large, in 2000, 2010, I was recognized by Cal State Bakersfield um, with the Board of Trustees Award uh, for my success. Um, and I also found myself on the Dean's List seven times and other merited awards, which I was very proud of. Um, very soon after, I was on a McNair Scholar, and that McNair Scholarship would lend me the opportunity to go to Temple University and uh, get my master's degree in African American Studies. Um, and all of that was because of the fostering and the cultivation at CSU Bakersfield for ethnic studies at the time, um, and also um, the continued tra trajectory. After Temple University, I heard about a university called Cal State Dominguez Hills, who um, had an opportunity to be a part-time faculty as an adjunct professor in the Africana Studies Department last year, which would lend an opportunity to work at the California African American Museum as their history curator. And so by and large, I just really want to um, say thank you to all of the Board of Trustees and the presidents who are in this room, because what you are doing for students of color, particularly black boys, are giving them the opportunities to succeed in ways that will be culturally relevant and inform the futures of so many others. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tyree. 
Thank you for sharing your story and being with us this morning. We are truly proud to have you as part of our CSU alumni family. Uh, thank you, Chair Eisen. That concludes my report. Thank you so much, President Morales, and thank you for that wonderful story. Um, it's now time for the board to consider our regular agenda, but before we get there, I want to just take a moment and recognize uh, Trustee Rhea Salinas, who has some uh, requests and remarks for us. Thank you, Chair Eisen. Uh, I wanted to make a comment uh, due to the current political climate regarding DACA students. Uh, Trustee Simon and Trustee Melinda de Santa Ana and I, in collaboration with CSSA, will bring a resolution in November for the board to take a stance in support of a solution for our students. And to also stand behind our chancellor and our chair's statements, as well as our campus president's actions on this issue. So hopefully we get the approval in November, but I wanted to thank Chair Eisen for allowing me this time and hopefully we can work all together for this resolution. Thank you. Thank you so much and we will work together on that, I assure you. Uh, it's now time for the board to consider the consent agenda. All of the committee items requiring full board approval are listed on the consent agenda. Does any trustee wish to remove any item from the consent agenda? May I have a motion then to approve all of the items listed on so the moved. consent agenda? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The items listed on the consent agenda are approved. The board will now adjourn into closed session to discuss executive personnel matters. The board will reconvene for our next meeting on November 7th, 8th. Notice of the meeting will go out in the ordinary course 10 days in advance of the meeting. Thank all of you very much. Please adjust your